welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Now, God has brought us to the point where we're beginning to meet with Him in the Holy of Holies, entering into His holy presence more and more. And we need to to know what to do when we're there. Because just lapsing into silence doesn't fulfill the Lord's purpose. If you've got your Bible, turn to, uh, and you should have, of course, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. If you're visiting us, you may not have your Bible with us, but... Now, this passage we know well and has been uh, used a number of times already this term. Verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God, with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Now, I want to focus this morning on the first part of verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Okay, now, what does it mean to have a sincere heart and the full assurance of faith. Let's speak about the one who lives in you. God has given to you as a believer the gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand the nature of the Holy Spirit and what God wants to work in us now, now that we've come to this point, by the power of his Spirit. Because it's only the Holy Spirit that can take us beyond where we are now into what God has for us. So there has to come a greater and greater dependence upon the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to enable us to fulfill what God intends. Now, we know that his ultimate purpose for every one of us, for every believer, is to transform us into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. To keep that work of transformation, of changing us, so we become more and more like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, not only as he was when he was here on earth, but he, as he is now, the glorified Christ, ruling and reigning in heaven. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us, imparted to us. Remember all that God has been talking to us about impartation. He has imparted his spirit to us in order that that spirit may have a greater and greater impact on our lives, you impart to have impact. When you pray for someone, you impart to them so that something of the life and the power of God will impact their lives. So God has imparted his spirit to us to impact our lives. And the more and more we are you could say submitted to the Spirit, surrendered to the leadership of the Spirit, the more faith we have in the anointing of the Spirit that God has given us, the greater the impact of the Holy Spirit on our lives. And that, of course, affects the way we serve, the way we minister, the way that God can bear fruit in our lives. So let's talk first about the nature of this spirit as we 
read in scripture. He is the spirit of holiness. And without going this morning into a long uh, description of holiness, let's say that if we sum it all up, it's Christ-likeness. The one who lived the holy life here on earth was, of course, Jesus Christ. So holiness ultimately is Christ-likeness. So God is drawing us into the Holy of Holies, into his holy presence, so that we can be more Christ-like. And the more the spirit of holiness impacts our lives, the more like him we become. But now we need to be very practical and see what that means in our daily lives. There is no holiness without love. If the, whole, if the spirit of holiness is working in you, then the spirit of love is working in you. The more we increase in the holiness of God in our lives, the more we increase in love. Now that love, of course, will be expressed towards God. And Jesus has made it very clear that if we love him, we will obey him, so fruit of that, obedience, of that love is obedience, just as the fruit of holiness is Christ-likeness. So what we're doing as we come into his holy presence, we're not just being silent and if you're on your face before the Lord, not just lying there waiting for something to happen, but our desire, if we have a sincere heart, our desire is for the Lord by the power of his spirit for Christ to impact us with more of his holiness, more of his Christ-likeness. So if we have a sincere heart, that is what we're desiring. That's why we're coming into his holy presence, because we have this desire to fulfill his purpose, which is to become more and more like him. And therefore, it's the desire of our hearts that that spirit of love will impact us more and more. Love for him and therefore love for one another. If that love is not expressed towards others, it isn't real. It's not the love of God. Whatever we think it is, we don't have the love of God unless that love immediately moves us to love other people, to love those around us, that we love one another as he has loved us, but also to love any that to whom he sends us, whether it's when we go out in mission or uh, whatever contacts we have with other people. That spirit of love is to be absolutely paramount in our lives. If the love isn't there, the holiness isn't there. If the holiness is there, the love will be there. And you've heard me say many times that the mark of true revival is this love. It's this love because actually in revival people are living in the holiness of God. But, but what you see is you, don't, you can't see holiness. But what you can see is the evidence of love. And that's why where there is, where there is true revival you see this amazing love that people have for God. They're just sold in love really for Jesus and for other people. Uh, they're just, they're, they become an embodiment of God's love. Now, God is increasing that love in our lives and amongst us. But you see, there's much more to come, isn't there? And that's where, with a sincere heart, we're desiring, Lord, I want more of your love. I need more of your love. And when we're seeking God, two things, uh, uh, we're doing two things. We're taking hold of the blood 
of Jesus. And remember, there's no revival without a focus on the blood. Because the blood cancels out all the negatives. So if we just take this love, for example, uh, our prayer really is, Lord, I don't want anything that is a denial of your love. I don't want anything that undermines love in my life. Show me if there is anything. And I want to turn away from anything that is contrary to your love. And I want you to impact me more and more and more with your love. If this is the desire of your heart, then you, are, you get passionate about this. You really long for this. It's not praying this because it's the good thing to pray or because that's what you ought to be praying for or because it's what Pastor Collins said in a keynote address. It's because it's the desire of your heart. But as you pray that, you have this faith. Come with a sincere heart and in the fullness of faith to believe that that is what God is working in response to what we're praying. So every time we encounter God, something is transforming and changing in our lives. Every day there's going to be change. There's going to be something happening we may not feel anything, we may not experience anything when we're praying, but if we're praying with faith, something is going to actually happen in us. And we're going to see the outworking of that in relationship to other people, because you can only really see where you are spiritually in relationship to others. While you just think of yourself and, and your relationship with Jesus, you can be totally unrealistic as to where you believe you are. It's when we have to relate to others, then you see where you really are in terms of your relationship with the Lord. So, God has delivered us from legalistic religion, but the scripture says that it's the law of the spirit of life that is now at work within us. And God has been speaking to us all term already that his purpose is for us to have the fullness of that life. So what does that mean? It means his life becomes my life. Now look, when we were talking about impartation, I made it clear to you that when you do something in the name of Jesus, if you lay hands on someone in his name, your hands become God's hands. That's not you, it's God touching the life of that person to impart something of his life, love, power, healing, whatever it may be. And you see, this is what the scriptures teach us. That the more we are submitted to the Lord, the more we become who he is. So, his desire is for his life to become our lives. Our lives become his life. So what we're living is not our lives, but his life. Are you understanding me? And this is why Paul talks about the spirit or, or the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Because what is operating in us now is the spirit of life, is the spirit of love, is the spirit of holiness. So Jesus said, when you receive the spirit, when the spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. So, his power becomes your power. 
And his power is so much greater than your normal, natural human power that you want to live in his power, in his life, in his love, not in your own strength. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So if I lay hands on someone to impart, it's not my power, obviously, his power. And nothing is impossible for his power. My faith needs to be, I'm imparting his power in his name. That's why it's not a question of praying words to Jesus, but doing something in the name of Jesus, on behalf of Jesus. It's saying, here is God's power. So, of course, the spirit is the spirit of healing. But we know that the power of God is much more than, than just the power to heal because it's the power that enables us to do everything in our lives that glorifies the Lord. Now, this is the key to everything, that the spirit is the spirit of glory. If God's purpose is to transform us into his likeness from one degree of glory to another, then he has had to impart to us the spirit of glory. And this is why Jesus, when he was praying for all those who had become believers, in John 17, before he went to the cross, he said, I have given them, and this is a prophetic word, of course, because he was talking not only about those who have already believed him, but those who will believe in him in the future, which means he was praying for us. And he says to the Father, I have given them the glory that you gave me. So the spirit of holiness is in you, the spirit of love is in you, the spirit of power is in you, the spirit of life is in you, the spirit of glory is in you. Because that's who the spirit is when God imparted his spirit to you when you were born of the Spirit and then filled with the Spirit, when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So the glory of God is there within you. So if you're going to be transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, that is only going to happen because you are submitted more and more to that glory. The more you are submitted to that glory, the more that glory can impact your life. Can you see, this is a matter of degree. God has given you everything that the Holy Spirit is. But it's a matter of degree as to how much that spirit actually impacts your life. And what this scripture is saying is that's all dependent upon where you are in your heart and where you are in your faith. How submitted you are in your heart and what you really believe God can work in you and through you by the power of his spirit, by the presence of his spirit. So this is such a tremendous gift. Jesus says, he is the spirit of truth, who guides us into all the truth, who takes the things of Jesus and declares declares those things to us. And Jesus taught that if we know the truth, then we will be set free. We will be his disciples if we live in the truth, and that truth will set us free. So the spirit is the spirit of truth, and where that truth is operating, there will be freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So he is the spirit of freedom as well. Don't get too excited because it's Tuesday morning. But we need to be so thankful that you have the spirit of freedom within you. So if there's ever a situation in which you don't feel free... It's not a question of whether God on his throne wants to set you free. He's already given you the spirit of freedom. He's already given you the truth and the spirit of truth that will set you free. So it's a question of allowing what was imparted to you 
to impact you more. Are you getting this? What is given needs to then influence, be operating in your life in the full way that God intends. So this is amazing that all this is already at work in you. And of course, Jesus said all these things about living in love and obedience to him, that his joy may be in us, and that that our joy will be full. So he is the spirit of joy. So where the spirit of God is really operating in the lives of people, where there is that faith to believe that what God has imparted is allowed to impact us in the situations in which we're placed, there is always joy, always joy. As soon as you've stopped rejoicing, you've stopped walking by faith. You've heard me say that again and again. Joy is the barometer of your faith. You know that while you're rejoicing, you are in faith. If you've stopped rejoicing, you have now got your eyes either on yourself and your feelings or your circumstances or the problems, and you're thinking about things, you're trying to work out things for yourself. But while Jesus is a focus... And the Holy Spirit always makes Jesus a focus. He guides us into all of the truth. He reminds us of what Jesus has said to us and what Jesus has done. Then we are joyful, which is why Paul says rejoice always. <laughs> Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Because you have the spirit of joy within you. Amen? And of course, if we operate in that joy, that's going to keep the spirit of heaviness away. The enemy always wants to try to contradict every one of these things. So, you know, he, he doesn't want holiness in our lives. He doesn't want love or God's life or anything. So he all the time is trying to get us to focus on ourselves or focus on other people. You can focus on the situation. You can focus on anything except Jesus as far as the enemy is concerned. And, and we're not going to be motivated by the enemy. We're not going to have our lives dictated by the enemy. So we are going to be the most joyful people on earth. But let me tell you, this joy is not rolling around on the floor in uncontrollable laughter. You don't see anything like that in, in the Gospels. This joy is the joy of knowing that you're at one with God. It's the joy of knowing that you're fulfilling the purpose of God. Amen? Sometimes this, that spirit of, of joy comes upon people to set them free. That's fine. But, you know, having been set free, we get on with the job. We don't want to roll around on the floor again just laughing. That, that doesn't produce any fruit. So, of course, if there's, pee, if there's joy, there's also peace. And you know the peace of God is giving you that complete well-being. So where the Spirit is in control in our lives, where, he, where we've yielded control to him, where we're allowing him to impact us in the way that he desires, there's joy and there's peace. And even if you're in really difficult circumstances, trying circumstances, challenging circumstances, that will never affect your peace. You won't get all worried and anxious and fretful because of what's happening. Even in the midst of the most terrible circumstances, you will have peace with God. And if you have peace with God, then actually you will overcome. No matter what the situation, you will overcome. Because this is another evidence of how we're trusting God. We're not allowing the situation to undermine our faith. We're not victims of the situation, but we're victors over the situation. So we have peace with God. And then... We'll just, I mean, this is not exhaustive, but of course he is the spirit of victory. He's the spirit that enables us to overcome. And we overcome by 
using the authority that God has given us. And we know that there is a connection between the authority and the power, that authority and power go together. They're not the same thing, but in Scripture they are operating together. So when you see the power of God in Jesus' ministry, it's because he exercised authority. And you see, when you lay hands on someone to impart, you need to realize that you're exercising authority. You're not hoping something will happen. You are speaking into being what is definitely going to happen. You have the authority to do that in the name of Jesus. Of course, that means that we're being led by the Holy Spirit in whatever we do. Jesus was led by the Spirit. The early Christians in the New Testament were led by the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit. It's not just a question of doing whatever we want, our own thing in our own way. But whatever we do in his name, we do with his authority. To do something in his name means he gives us the authority to do it on his behalf. Jesus doesn't walk around on earth now, as he did 2,000 years ago, except in you and in others like you, who have the impartation of his spirit, who have the calling, therefore, to do things in his name. So Paul says, whatever you do in word or do, deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now we could go on and on and say, well, he is the spirit of worship, he is the spirit of prayer, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, we could think of all the fruit of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit. The spirit enables all of those things in our lives. But this is enough for us to be getting on with. So the question always is, okay, how much of the holiness of God is impacting your life at this moment? How much of the love, how much of the life, how much of the power? How is God being glorified in you at present? How much freedom is there because you're walking in the truth? How much joy, peace? Victory in your life. Now this is where we have to obey the scripture that says, have a sober estimate of yourself. Don't be unrealistic in thinking that you're in a place with God that you're not. But on the other hand, don't be full of unbelief and deny the place you are with God. So, you know what you have because he's imparted all this, this spirit of holiness, of love, of life, of power, of glory, of truth, of joy, of peace, of victory to you. But the question is how much of all those qualities of the spirit are actually being reproduced in your life at this present, this present moment? Now, this is a matter of degree, as I keep saying. I know in my life that unless I keep submitting myself to God in all these ways, I cannot continue to grow in the things of the Spirit. Now, I've been at this business for a lot longer than any of you in terms of of walking with the Lord. But still there's so much more room in my life for more of all these qualities. So as I seek God, I have to submit myself to him and the prayer of my heart, the desire, the longing, the passion of my heart has to be that I want more of every one of those qualities in my life. So if I'm coming before God, before the throne of God, what do I find there? According to the scripture, I find mercy and grace to help me in my time of need. So what does that mean? Every time I come before the Lord, I'm going to be faced with the way in which I lack there's too many things about me still that are not like that. 
So that's fine because of the blood of Jesus. I can acknowledge that and be cleansed of that immediately. But then we find grace to help us in a time of need. What is my need? My need is to be more like Jesus. My need is for more of his love, more of his life, more of his power, more of his glory to be revealed in my life. This is my need, this is my desire, this is my longing, this is my passion, if I love him. <coughs> this is a bit different from normal church life that many people experience, isn't it? And you see, this is the sad thing, that there are so many Christians born again, even filled with the Spirit, who know about Jesus, but who don't really know Jesus. They don't know him like this. Because you see, to know the spirit is to know Jesus. Because the spirit who lives in you is the spirit of the living Christ. <clears throat> Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Paul says that's the secret. The secret of the, the Christian life is Christ in you. What does it mean to have Christ in you? means to have his holiness, his love, his life, his power, his glory, his truth, his joy, his peace, his victory being expressed in your life more and more. <laughs> Listen, God does not exist just to set you free from things the world has done to you. Freedom, in that sense, is important. But that's not the purpose of God. He does that in order to equip us for his purpose. He deals with all the negative things in order to equip us to become the people that radiate what? The life of his kingdom. And see, th this is the thing. What the scripture says is when we see him face to face, we will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Just like that. And we will become like Jesus. Now you see, spiritual idiots will think, well, it doesn't matter too much how I live now because at the end I will be transformed like Jesus. But why should God transform us if we don't want to be like him while we're here on, in this life? And what will the reward be in heaven for those who never wanted to be like Jesus while they were here on earth? They might be saved, but only as through fire. There's never been that heart desire to glorify the Lord, to please him, to honor him, to fulfill his purpose while they were here on earth. And there are so many warnings in scripture about how dangerous it is to know about the will of God and not to do the will of God. So we can see that this is the will of God for us. And yes, we need to be set free from anything and everything that opposes and undermines that, so that then we can seek him with all our hearts. Yeah. And what does God say? You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your hearts. So it's what we do when we come into his presence that really matters. That we're not just there lapsing into silence as sometimes happens, waiting for something to happen. Waiting on the Lord is not waiting for him to do something. It's coming up before him to avail ourselves of that mercy and that grace that we need. It's the throne of grace. And you know, grace is what God gives to those who deserve nothing. So as we come before him, we recognize we deserve nothing of ourselves, but we have access right into his holy presence because of the blood of Jesus. That blood has opened up the way for us to be able to meet with him now so that he can impact us 
more and more with all these qualities. So have we got this? Make sense? Right, now, I'm going to pick out one of these things for special mention. If God's purpose is to transform us into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, the glory of God needs to become ever more significant in our lives. Okay. So what does that mean? The glory becomes your motivation. Whatever you do, whatever decisions you make, the glory of God. You do all for the glory of God. If God can't be glorified in it, don't do it. It can't be his will. It's more likely to be sin. So you see, those of you who are here as students, you made a decision to come here as a student. You were responding to the call of God. Now, whether you consciously realized it or not, You are making a decision for his glory. You are coming and submitting yourself to a time of training, of learning, of being equipped to be a disciple for whatever way God is going to use you in the future. You are making a decision for his glory. Some of you, when you came, may not have even wanted to come, but knew you had to come. That it was what God was saying. And you may have had all kinds of reservations, but now you're here, you're so blessed, and you realize how much it has been God's purpose for you to be here because of all that he's done in your life ever since. And you see, this is the point. To live for the glory of God is not to live for ourselves. And that's the tension in the life of every person, of every believer. We always have the option of pleasing self or pleasing God. To glorify God is to please him, to make decisions that please him, to say what pleases him, to do what pleases him. Because if it pleases him, it's definitely going to be for his glory. Because the only things that please God are the things that glorify him. He's never pleased in anything that does not glorify him. And I'm not going to go into a long uh, word about it this morning. But you see, right at the beginning of this term, God showed us the difference between his permissive will and his sovereign will. His permissive will doesn't please him. He allows it, but it doesn't please him. His sovereign will pleases him. It's what he wants. It's where he rules. It's where he reigns. So this is a very simple way of learning to walk at one with Jesus. Simply by asking yourself the question, is this glorifying the Lord? Or when you're having to make a decision, will this glorify the Lord? Or what will glorify the Lord? If he's not glorified in it, forget it. If it's for his glory, then do it even when you don't want to. And you see, this this is the tension that Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I'd much prefer not to have to go to the cross. But if this is what will glorify you, if this is your will, not my will, what will glorify you, what will honor you, what will fulfill your plan and purpose. And of course, because Jesus accepted the Father's will, he is then glorified. And you see, the same is true for us. What is the nature of this love? You can say, well, it's the love that inspires us to obey. But why? Why is obedience the fruit of this love? Because it's sacrificial love. So when Jesus talked about loving one another as he has loved us, he said there is no greater love than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. So if actually the love of God is impacting our lives, then, as you've heard me say again and again, we live for others and not ourselves. Because you can only live for God by living for others. If you don't live for others, you're not living for God. It doesn't matter how spiritual you think you are. It's that love for him that moves us to love others. So it's a sacrificial love. That means it's going to cost us something. And if we avoid cost, we avoid the purpose of God. All we want is a nice, comfortable Christian life where we think God is going to supply everything for us. But that's not being a disciple. That's not living for the glory of God. That's not being used of God to further his kingdom purposes. So it's a joyful life. Why? Because, you see, when you live this life with Jesus, it doesn't matter how costly it is, because you lose sight of the cost. You know, sometimes people have said to me, what a cost I have paid in my life in different ways. And, you know, I hear what they're saying. But it never, it's never seemed like that to me at all. Because the blessings so far outweigh the cost. <coughs> if you're worried about the cost, you're still worried about yourself. And you're not really focused on the will and the purpose of God. But if you want the will and the purpose of God, love is not costly. It doesn't seem costly. Yes, you're paying a price. Jesus paid the price on the cross. But what does the scripture say? It was because of the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Beyond any cost, there is always the joy of knowing that you fulfilled the purpose of God, that you've done what he wanted. Hallelujah. So, we don't look back. We look forward. Always forward. He who looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God, says Jesus. So we look forward to what God is wanting to do in us. So even when it comes... to wanting to see all this fulfilled in our lives, we are utterly dependent upon the thing that I have not put up there yet, but is the essential element of the life of the Spirit that we need. He is the Spirit of faith. 
our human faith isn't enough. We need the spirit of faith. What does that mean? We need the faith of Jesus. Now, just, just as we finish, let, let, me, let me put this very simply for you, okay? This is Jesus in you. 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 And even this is Jesus in you. The secret is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. The only way in which we can glorify the Lord and be transformed into his likeness with increasing glory is by his spirit, by that operation of faith that God gives us. The spirit of faith operating in our lives Every day, so that we believe that even as we draw near to God, to that throne of grace and His mercy, and the grace to help us in our time of need, we have that assurance of faith. We have the right hearts full of passion for what God wants in our lives, and we're full of faith the faith that God has imparted to us. By the spirit of faith. Yes, I believe, Lord, that your purpose is for all these things to be increasingly revealed in my life. More and more and more. Every day that I meet with you, more of that life, more of that fullness, more of your spirit is being released into my life. Not because I have an experience, but because I believe. Hallelujah. And the more I believe, the more that life will pour out of me. Hallelujah. And that's important, you see, because when you impart how much of the power of the life of the victory of God can be poured through you, the more you are submitted to him, the more of that life can be imparted to others. So this is not just in your own interests. First and foremost, it's for the glory of God. But just imagine how many lives during the rest of your life can be impacted by Jesus because more and more and more of his spirit was pouring out of your life and touching their lives. Wow. What a God. Come on, let's all stand. Come out of our comfort zones. Thank you, Jesus. I'm happy. Is anybody else happy? I want to hear people sounding happy here, praying with joy this morning. Where there's faith, there's joy. Now just remember that. Where faith is operating, there's always joy. Praise you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Papara sandaria letto bacala siti di sandana. O papara sandaria letto bacala siti di sandana. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Papara sandaria letto bacala siti di sandana. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We exalt your holy name. We bless your holy name. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It is for freedom you have set us free. Hallelujah. You've called us to be free. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Pura la basandari e lero bakala sitri sandama. O papara zandari e lero bakala sitri sandama. O papara zandari e lero bakala sitri sandama. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I bless you, I praise you, I exalt you, Lord. Kura la basandari e lero bakala sitri sandama. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Popara zandari elero bakala sidama. Popara zandari elero bakala sidri sandari elero bakala sidri sandama. O papara zandari elero bakala sidri sandama. O papara zandari elero bakala sidri sandama. Oh, hallelujah. Now thank the Lord for what he has imparted to you. This precious gift of the Holy Spirit. Christ in you. The Spirit of the living Christ in you. Hallelujah. Kura la basandari eledo bakala sidama. Bupara zandari eledo bakala sidri sandama. Bupara zandari eledo Now is it the passion of your heart? Come on, pour out your heart. Is it the passion of your heart to be more and more Christ-like? I want more of your holiness, Lord. More of your love. More of your life to be revealed in my life. More of your power, Lord, so I can be more effective in impartation more of your glory to be revealed in my life. Because of your sovereign will being outworked in my life, more of your truth, Lord, setting me free, setting others free as I speak and act in your name. More and more and more of your joy, Lord, because your faith is operating in my life and I'm just walking at peace with you, at one with you, in unity with you. Praise you, Jesus. Popara zandari elero bakala sita balandama. Oh, let's thank you, Lord, for the authority to establish your victory. Your victory over sin. Your victory over the devil. Your victory over the circumstances. Your victory over all opposition. Your victory over fear. Your victory over all unbelief. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I have the spirit of victory. I have the overcomer living in me. And I praise your holy name. I bless your holy name. I worship your holy name. Papara zandari elero bakala sidri sandama. Oh, papara zandari elero bakala sidama. Papara zandari elero bakala sidri balandama. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, tell the Lord you believe it. That this is his purpose for you. More and more and more and more of Jesus Christ in you. More and more and more of his spirit. Oh, thank him for the freedom that he gives you. And thank him for how he wants you to use that freedom. To glorify him. Hallelujah, by fulfilling his sovereign will. Popara zandari eletu bakala sidri sandama. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've submitted yourself this term to his sovereign will, not his permissive will. You want what he wants, not what you want, not just what he allows. You want what he wants. 
You want his best purpose for your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Popara sandaria leto pakala sitri sandama. O papa pakala sandaria leto pakala sitri sandama. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Popara sandaria leto pakala sandama. Yes, 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 yes. Those of you that are beginning the freedom course, just thank God that this is his will for you to come into a greater, greater sense of personal freedom so there aren't anything, any hindrances in your life to hold you back from God's best purposes. He has called us to be free. Hallelujah. And even if you're not doing the freedom course, the same truth applies to you. Lord, I want to be set free from anything in my life that is a denial of those things that is on the board this morning. I don't want anything undermining your sovereign will in my life. Now, when you first came as a student, you probably had no idea that this is what God was going to get you into. You might have thought, whoa, this is going to be way beyond me, and yet here you are. God is already working this out in you. The process has already begun. And there is more and more of Jesus in your life than you could perhaps ever have realized when you started as a student a few months ago. But there's so much more to come. Hallelujah. There's always more, more, and much more. So, Holy Spirit, we want to see you released in our lives increasingly. So there's more of Jesus and less of us. Thank you that you say your grace is sufficient for us and your power is made perfect in weakness. That when we're weak, then we're strong. So thank you, Lord. We know our own weakness, but we know the strength of the one who lives in us. We know the power of the one who lives in us. We know the victory, the overcoming power of the one who lives in us. We know the faithfulness of the one who lives in us. We know the love of the one who lives in us. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Not I, but Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Puparazandaria leto bakalasitri sandama. Oh, papara zandaria lero bakala sitri sandama. Oh, papara zandaria lero bakala sitri sandama. Oh, papara zandaria lero bakala sitri sandama. Oh. Now, what about your heart? We had to come with sincere hearts. That means we're not desiring for ourselves, but for the glory of God, for his will, his purpose to be outworked in our lives. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, doesn't it? Hearts 
full of longing for more of Jesus. Is that your heart this morning? Is that really your heart? Oh, Lord, I just long for more of you. I long to know you better. I long to walk more closely with you. I long for more of your love, more of your life, more of your power to be revealed in my life. I long for more of you, Jesus. Or have you lost your first love? That longing you had when you first became a believer. Well, those of you who have been students here, God has restored that first love. And he's taking you beyond that first love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That can only be the work of the Spirit, can't it? Hallelujah. Can you tell the Lord that you believe him to work this out in you? Spirit of faith operating in your life. Lord, we recognize we can't do it without the faith that you give us. You are the author and you are the perfecter of our faith. So, Lord, I thank you for the faith for your will. Not faith for my will, but faith for your will, Lord. Faith for your will to be outworked in my life. Thank you, Jesus. It's not what I want, it's what you want. It's not what I plan, it's your plan for my life. It's not my purpose, it's your purpose. It's not my will, it's your will. So thank you, Lord. My hands become your hands as I submit myself to you. My life becomes your life, and your life becomes my life. Your love becomes my love. Your power becomes my power. Your glory becomes whatever glory there can be in my life. Your joy becomes my joy. Your peace becomes my peace. This is amazing, Lord. This is just so amazing. So amazing. Hallelujah. Your freedom becomes my freedom. Hallelujah. 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 Korala bakala sandaria leto bakala sidama. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God. What a wonderful God. How we worship you. How we glorify your name. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, come on. Let's have a great burst of praise to finish this morning. O papara zandaria lero bakala siti di sandaria lero bakala siti di sandana. O papara zandarama. Hallelujah. Is God good? Or is God good? What a Lord, eh? Can you understand why Paul says he is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or imagine according to that power that is already at work within us? He's going to take you beyond anything you could ever have imagined. He might already have done that, but he's going to do it more and more and more. He's going to amaze you. He's going to amaze you by what he does in you and then what he does through you. What a God. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.